I'm Thomas. Most of you might know me. So those who looked at the schedule, they saw there's uh, still this stale coming soon thing. There's a story behind it. Uh, NAL uh, poked me early this year and asked me whether I could come. And I said, I don't know, there was a uh, potential family event, uh, schedule conflict on the horizon. So I told her, I will come back to you once this is settled. It was settled a couple of weeks later. Of course, I never came back to her. So she poked me again in July and said, have your schedule conflicts been resolved? I said, yes, yeah, sure, didn't I tell you? Of course not. Um, so I agreed to come and she put me into that slot and I looked at the, at the, at the web page and it said, uh, talk title coming soon. And I said, this is a great title. I'm going to talk about things coming soon. <laughs> A couple of days later, I actually sat down, wrote an email, or started to write an email where I wanted to put in some content, what this coming soon things might be. Um, and last week, when I actually started to think about making slides, I tried to remember what I was going to talk about. So I went back to the web page of kernel recipes and so, oh, there's coming soon, there's no link, but I'm sure I sent her a mail. No, it was in my draft folder, still sitting there. <laughs> okay, so I said, yes. Um, I mean, I, would I wanted to talk about the obvious things coming soon, print K, preemptor T, my retirement and whatever. Um, I mean, the last one is the most predictable of all. Um, so, but uh, the week before that, uh, roughly exactly a week before I started to think about slides, I have the habit to read email in the evening, walk through my email backlog, which is always tremendously huge, look at some interesting mail threads, have a glass of wine, and enjoy the reading. Okay, I saw this one. And yes, no, I didn't enjoy it. So what it is about, there's problems with preempt none and preempt voluntary. If you do long loops, you store weight the system or create long latencies. And people try again to work around it. We already have a lot of workarounds. So as I'm getting wiser and older, or the other way around, older and wiser, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I would have immediately fired up the email client that said, oh, what the hell is this? Um, no, I got smarter than that. Took it back, mulled it over, over in my head, and at some point when I was walking in the forest, I realized, hey, I solved this problem before. Um, so then I was talking to a couple of people and I noticed that most of them do not even understand what the different preemption models are. So I said, oh, coming soon is cool. I do a talk about this thing. So we have four preemption models in the kernel. At least most people think so. Um, they are not really four preemption models. Um, actually, it's two. But I come to that. So we have these four, and I walk you through them and what they are about. So none is preemptive multitasking in user space. It's based on time slicing or priority scheduling. Uh, so any user space application, any user space uh, computation can be preempted out at any given time, uh, point in time. There's no way to prevent that. So preemption model none, once you go into the kernel uh, via a syscall, you enter a different preemption model because this switches from preemptive to collaborative. What does that mean? Collaborative means once you enter the syscall, the code can run to completion. Either it goes back to user space, and there is a preemption point. There it can be preempted before it goes back because it doesn't make sense to traverse back and then preempt, uh, come 
bring it in to preempt it. So I say we have this obvious point here. Or the task invokes schedule on its own. So here is uh, people like pictures. I do too. Um, what is C? Interrupt return. If you have an interrupt in user space, you go through this return to user work thing. There's a question, is there the need rescat flag set? If yes, we go into the schedule, the task gets preempted. And we come here to syscall, and on the return, we go through this question as well, or the, the, the code which is executed in the syscall voluntarily calls schedule. Now, what could go wrong? Any, because, if you look at this one again, any computation in that syscall, which can take, can do whatever it wants, as long as it doesn't block on something which ends up in schedule or voluntarily calls schedule, will just stay on the CPU forever. So, uh, which means latencies or you can actually bring it into system starvation. The bad news is we can detect that, but because preempt none has no information whether the code is in a critical section, which means it doesn't know whether it holds a spin lock, for example, so there's no way to forcefully preempt it. And that's bad. So what can be done about that? People came up with, oh, let's do some uh, opportunistic voluntary scheduling points, and we put them in this large loop. So you have this loop which does uh, iterates over, over a big array of data, and you do chunk-wise, let's say, one page at, at, at a time, and once you process the page, you do a cont rescat call, which is just checking the need rescat flag, and then if it's set, it goes to schedule and says, I'm fine to be scheduled out. Uh, that kind of solves the problem. But it has a few issues. I'll come to that in a minute. So, we didn't change much on that picture. It's still the same. It just added this countries kit where we can programmatically say it's a good point to preempt me. Uh, there are caveats how to place that stuff. So, this is the example you process data and do countries kit. All fine. Here is the wrong example. You hold the mutex. You process data and then you can't rescat and then you release the mutex because the whole point of run to completion is avoid contention. I mean, there's other arguments for it to be made like um, cache locality and all these kinds of things. But one of the main uh, issues, and you can uh, observe that for throughput oriented workloads, if you switch from none or voluntary to full preempt, you will see. Um, a throughput degradation, but it's mostly through to resource and lock contention. It's not so much, I mean, if you want to squeeze the lost percent out of it, that's the cache locality problem, but it's usually n not the main source of trouble. Um, so you should better do it this way. Um, so it's manual placement, it's how do you choose the chunk size? Okay, one page is okay for your, for your big server machine. It might be eight pages. So what's the right thing to do? So because you, the same code has to run on the ORM 32-bit uh, uh, SOC with runs at 200 megahertz. So if, if you do eight pages in a row, you might be way out of the, of the latency window and trigger lockouts and whatever the hell. We have, we have seen that. So this puts severe limitations on what you can do, and it also 
makes all these mechanisms fragile because they p depend on the personal preference or the personal um, imagination of a particular developer. We have seen changes over the time for these kind of constructs. Uh, oh, we misplaced it. It gets reshuffled because code gets reworked. The, the contrees cat stays at the same same place where it was before, and it's fundamentally wrong now. Um, so that's preempt none. Preempt voluntary is not any different than preempt none from the basic principles. It's preempt full preemptive. Uh, multitasking in user space and its cooperative multitasking in kernel space. The only different thing is that it adds additional opportunistic preemption points might sleep. Yeah, it might sleep, it might read schedule inter internally. So it's just more of those voluntary points. Some of them are part of locking or weight primitives, so they are um, automatically generated uh, without you doing it. They have been placed there because it's cool. Uh, I'll show you why it's not so cool. Uh, what bothers me about this is might sleep in its initial implementation was a pure debugging uh, aid. So if you go and take a mutex, might sleep will catch you when you have preemption disabled or you hold something else which avoids you, uh, prevents you from being uh, uh, schedulable. Uh, so somebody thought it's a good idea we glue might rescat and cod rescat into it. It's very easy to misplace and it's automatically injected by lock and weight primitives, which is not necessarily the best thing to do if you think about it. Let me show it to you. So it's simple wait for completion. Return to user space. That's our preemption point. But wait for completion by nature. If the completion is not there, you're going to schedule. So you have another point where we go out. But right before we actually check whether we, whether we want to schedule or not, we say, oh, let's we might schedule here. And then we have suddenly four, three uh, points where we can schedule. So. We, I observed that by, by experimentation earlier, that these embedded country scats, which are automatically injected, um, can cause uh, redundant task switching. It's it's not. Um, it depends on the workload whether it's observable or really observable or not. Here's another example where it gets really bad because we have it embedded in the mutex lock. Uh, function two. So you, before you take a, can take a mutex, the, the, the debug thing checks whether you can actually schedule because you might block on the mutex. Now you take the mutex A, you take the mutex B, and if you look at it, how it looks inside, you already have lock A, and then you lock B, and then you schedule out, but then. Uh, again, you create more contention potential than it actually uh, than you actually want, and this can be observed too. It really depends. So, voluntary was added by the mostly by the the, the desktop people and audio and whatever they wanted to have a, a little bit faster reaction times. Yes, they are. Uh, but it's randomly sprinkled. There's no methodology around it, so it's yeah, interesting. So it provides better latencies. It otherwise has the same issues. If there is no voluntary rescheduling point anywhere, you're going to starve the system. Scheduler can't uh, force preempt, and it has slightly more contention potential than um, none. So then. We wanted to have full preemption, uh, full preemptive multitasking everywhere. Great, that's what everybody wants uh, because of lower latencies for particular workloads. It's all based still on time slicing and priority, and we have some restricted areas in the kernel where we can't actually preempt. 
uh, simplest example, you hold a spin lock. Uh, so now you get preempted. The preempting task wants the same spin lock. So how is that going to work out? No, the preempting task is going to spin forever. That's why we disable preemption ex implicitly across that. So we have implicit uh, non preemptive kernel sections, spin reader writer logs, soft interrupts, exceptions, uh, anything where you have a local dire queue disable or a local button half disable, implicit preempt uh, disables preemption to per some of the per CPU accesses to. Uh, um, um, uh, disable preemption in order that you can't be migrated from from the CPU, um, and we have the explicit sections where you say consciously as a programmer here must be preemption disabled, and then you enable it again, and on the enable side, if uh, preempt disable all these these things in the locks and whatever or uh, nesting, or a nestable, so it's a counter, it's the preemption counter. So once you do uh, the first preempt disable, it's one, then it's two, it's three, and one, it, once you go back to zero, then every th the, the, the system knows there's no critical resource held anymore, so we are free to schedule. So if need rescat is set there on the transition to zero, then we can preempt. So, preempt disable, which is embedded in the, all these implicit things, preempts, preempt, prevents preemption, prevents migration, and you can't do any blocking operations. That's where might, risk, might sleep comes from, uh, because you catch the code which does a preempt disable and then tries to take a mutex. Um, just for those who don't know yet, uh, if it's solely about not being migratable because you want to stay on the CPU but you have otherwise no requirements because you have a, a mutex which serializes your uh, your data access or some other or lockless or whatever algorithm, uh, there's ways if you're in threat context you can just mi mi disable migration which is se completely separate. It does not disable preemption. Um, that's something we uh, we wanted to get into the tree for real time um, for a long time, and it turned out that it was the solution to the KMAP atomic issue, where KMAP atomic basically had to disable preemption in order um, to keep the the per CPU mapping the, the temporary mapping on the same CPU. Uh, we solved that with migrate disable and. Uh, a lot of the, the headaches and a lot of the horrible code constructs which were forced by that went away. Um, so let's look at our nice picture again. So the cons rescat, might rescat thing is are all gone. We all, all we rely on is preempt enable. Being uh, transitioning to zero and the need read scat flag being set. Um, Another change here is interrupts hitting kernel space. They now have a return to kernel entry where they check whether the preemption counter is zero and need rescat flag is set, and so they don't, in that case, they don't go back to the interrupted computation. They go back to, uh, they go into scheduler and let the scheduler preempt. Um, Uh, if there's any questions, please raise your hand. I'm happy to ask, uh, answer them in the middle of the talk. Uh, so the scheduler knows when preemption is safe. This reduces latencies, but aggressive uh, preemption can cause contention because if you hold a mutex, a non-spinning uh, uh, um, uh, lock uh, type. Uh, then you can't be preempted. Somebody else wants the same lock, and so it gets in, into a ping pong, uh, which is a trade off with the throughput. So now uh, there's a fourth 
uh, actually it's not that different. Uh, preemptor T um, is the same as full from a scheduler perspective in the first place. It just relies on uh, the preemption counter being dear and on um, pretty much everything being preemptible. So, but for as we saw before, some of this locking constructs like spin locks and whatever uh, disable preemption implicitly, and that's what preempt RT is really about to uh, convert these at compile time into sleeping locks, which we have priority inheritance. Um, and we mo force most interrupt handles into a thread. Soft IRQ processing is um, threaded, force threaded too. So we have nothing where we can have a situation where we hold one of those sleeping locks and try to take it in an interrupt context, which wouldn't work because you can't schedule. So that's the main change what RT does, but it does not introduce a new scheduling model. Uh, a new preemption model in the first place. We did that, and this was interesting because that was when I was mulling this mail in my head for a while, I realized, hey, I solved this problem years ago and didn't even realize that you can map it back into mainline on none. Um, so, yeah, this, the, 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 what or T does by this conversion of the spin lock, so you have further restrictions for non preemptible sections, no memory allocations when you hold real, real uh, raw spin locks or have explicitly preemption or interrupts disabled. This doesn't work on RT. Um, but this is just a, a side note. It has the same benefit and trade offs of full but it degrades way more, uh, it has better latencies, but it degrades way more on, on, the, on, on throughput, throughput because it has even more points to uh, preempt something. Um, which is what we want for our high priority task, which are latency sensitive, if you think about robotics control or whatever, or, uh, you really want it to, to execute every period you define to, because otherwise your motor might go somewhere. And you hit the, in, in, the, in the best case you hit the wall, in the worst case you hit the person. Uh, so, yes, we want that. But then you have other processes on the same machine, which do, uh, whatever, networking, web services, whatever, people come up with the weirdest ideas. So there the, 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 the throughput degrades most. It's because the Pardon? It's not about the points at which you might get rejected. It's about the points at which the scheduler does reject. Exactly. But this is most, for, for the real-time tasks, we want it now. Ah, OK. He said it's not a, not a problem of the, of the code itself. It's a problem of the decision of the scheduler when it reschedules. So and I realized that, that the throughput oriented task or using sched other. So I came up with something in RT, which is um, here is this, the over uh, preemption case. Because we didn't differentiate between or, or real time task being uh, doing the preemption or uh, sched other task preempting each other. So what I did to mitigate that, I introduced the concept of lazy preemption. So t for example, local sections uh, disable lazy preemption. <clears throat> they still can be force preempted by the scheduler for real-time tasks or for other purposes. It's just more or less a hint to avoid the, the over-eager uh, preemption. When I was mulling over this email, I realized this is exactly the problem none and con rescat and allow rescat and whatever we have is trying to solve. Right? So here is the use case why this allow rescat thing uh, was proposed. On x86, uh, 
you can uh, do memcopy and memset with uh, a wrapped prefix smooth as story instruction. This is very efficient and it gets even more efficient if you do that on, on huge pages. So if you clear uh, mem, uh, memset a full gigabyte, huge page uh, backed um, area of memory, then the hardware can do very nasty and efficient optimizations. The instruction itself is interruptible, so you can take an interrupt handle to interrupt, go back, uh, uh, and all the, rest the context in the registers is restored and it just resumes operation from where it was. But now, if you have really large things to clear or to mem copy, then yes, you take the interrupt, but you, because there's no con cat built into the CPU, instruction, you just go back and uh, clear another gigabyte. Hmm. Your latencies for other things go out of the window or you trigger some lockup uh, mechanism or whatever the hell. So if you go back to chunk-based loop processing, then you lose the ability of the hardware to optimize on the gigabyte, uh, on the gigabyte uh, 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 mapping because then you go back to what we were doing before, process 4K, 50K, or whatever chunks, and then do country scan and repeat and repeat and repeat. So you, so you don't get the benefit. And that's why they came up with this, oh, none, yes. Um, uh, we say, now it's allowed to reschedule, and now we forbid it again. Mm, so we we sprinkle more things around all, all over the place, and it's only effective for none and voluntary. <sighs> Seriously, what really broke my brain completely was: oh, we have we are so used to disable interrupts, disable preemption. Enable interrupts, enable preemption, disable local button hosts, enable them. So it's clearly scope based. The allow and uh, disallow rescare is scope based too, but it's the other way around. And if you get it wrong, it will explode in your face. It's error prone, it's really bad to do reverse semantics. Don't ever think about doing that. This is bad, really. In general, this is not, not particularly bad because of this. Uh, it's bad in general. If you have established semantics, don't try to bring up a new uh, methodology which does exactly this, the opposite. People will confuse that. And it's going to end badly. Um, so, what I said, we need to take a step back because most of the things we did to cure these latency issues and starvation issues on non and voluntary, or just because we said, oh, yeah, yeah, this is easy, we, we put a check deer. So, quick quiz. What do you guess how many countries cat uh, incarnations are all over the kernel tree? Close, 1,600. And I looked at a couple of them, and they, uh, on a regular basis, every other year, they got, get moved to a different place in the same code. Because it turns out, oh, we changed the code, uh, we forgot to move the thing, now it degrades in, in, in performance again, or we rescat at the wrong place because we hold a spin lock now. Great. Uh, and obviously, you never run lock tap on it, so because that would have caught it, you always use the preempt none kernel, so it's cool. So what bothers me about that is that constantly sprinkling things around the might, re might sleep debug uh, usurpation with the, with the scheduling point is, as I showed, is wrong. Uh, it's just making me more points randomly. There's no, no, no methodology, it's just Oh, yeah, we have more points now. Great. 
Uh, does it help? Oh, we don't know, but it looks better. Um, so what I really want to see, and I think this is just if you take this step back from a conceptual level. Yes, run to completion, collaborate, collaborative scheduling is fine. But if you take the, prevent the scheduler from making the ultimate decision, it's bad in my opinion, because you have to come up with all these hacks and works around, and you never get to, to a point where you actually can prevent it. You can see it, but in, if it happens in production, you're dead. Hmm. Maybe, good idea, no? I don't know, I hate it. Um, so, what I realized then, um, there was, a, there was long-going discussions um, whether we should enable the preem counter um, unconditionally in the kernel. And it was rejected all the way down over years because we were actively stupid how we implemented the preemption counter. Right now, the preemption counter is extremely cheap. I'm not saying it's free, but it's cheap. Uh, and we see that uh, most of the uh, or all uh, enterprise distros have enabled dynamic uh, preemption model switching, which most of them. I know RHEL, SUSE, um, and a couple of others do. So Oracle does not. Uh, yeah, you don't have customers we, which want both. So uh, anyway, so but this makes it clear that there's a there's even the trade-off might be acceptable now. Um, so if we go there and say, okay, we take the increment decrement in, um, we, uh, we, we eat that overhead, um, which is a single cash line because which is always hot. It's, any, it's hot anyway because there's other peer per CPU hot stuff in the same cash line, so it's not going to to hurt your, in, uh, hurt your D cache, it slightly increases I cache size. I, I, I totally uh, admit that. So it's not free, it's cheap. So, but with that, we can tell, have on all preemption models the knowledge when it is safe to preempt, which we can't tell on none or voluntary. So, if we enforce the preemption counter and know that this is this, we can steal the track from RT with the lazy preemption and only evaluate the lazy preemption bit on return to user space and nowhere else. And if the scheduler needs to enforce preemption for, because somebody ran, like the, the, the the, the, the rap move or rap stow thing looped, uh, took forever. It can it forcefully schedule out. And we don't have to annotate it. You can put what it can do. Yes, you can have a trace point up there where you force reschedule and you can identify the places which cause that forced reschedule, uh, which you can't today. Um, so, so n for non-involuntary, we would always use the lazy rescat mechanism for scat other. On time slice exhaustion, we enforce preemption with need rescat, and on preempt full, we just do always tiff need rescat like we do right now. Whether we want to keep those models around, I just made it in a way that it's compatible with the existing um, mechanism. So if you look at this, it's the same like full, but the scheduler decides whether to set the need rescat flag or the need rescat lazy flag, and we only evaluate ever the lazy flag on the return to user space, which preserves the non preemption model most of the time, except the stupid task decides to take full time slices, and the scheduler says, N I'm not longer playing nice guy, here is the hammer. But that's not the normal case. Um, so, 
What bothers me, too, about the non and in voluntary things, they basically prevent their schedule from making decisions. And we should not do that. We should keep the resource control of CPU on the scheduler and let the scheduler decide and we, if we need to, to have different uh, decisions made, then we have to do it in the scheduler and not at a random driver or at some random subsystem on the, uh, on the whim of a developer. Because what do, de what, what do developers do? They say, oh, my device is the most important one. I need to CPU forever and I need to do this now and whatever. This might be okay for his particular use case on his laptop, but this driver ends up on other people's machines too, and there this decision is completely wrong. So you, if you bring it under scheduler control, both people can have their, can have their, their go and configure and um, make the decisions in the scheduler, or tweak priorities or whatever, run times and all these kinds of things. So in in theory, and I think in practice, we can remove countries cont completely, including my cat or the, the, the embedded one in my cat um, And it, it avoids that we add new, really badly defined uh, annotations. And if we need hints for the scheduler, which tell the scheduler, hey, it's a bad idea to to, to preempt me now for the, for the non-model case. Uh, then we can come up with sensible ones which match our existing semantics, which are understandable for programmers. And of course, I'm the, the, I always have um, this extra eye for how can I utilize that for or it just falls in place. I don't have to have changes anymore. It's just the same because I can utilize lazy one to one. We already tried it. It works. Um, so, yes, that's if we need hints for the lazy preemption mode, uh, we come, have to come up with something which is scope based, where we clearly say, here is the section which starts, which you shouldn't preempt, and here it's a good idea to preempt. Everything else is stupid, it's, it, it's just undefined. And how do you understand it? But scopes are very well understood. And that's what we are talking about, because if you hold the mutex, it's scoped. Because the critical section where you don't want to preempt it in order to avoid that the other task is going to contend on the mutex is the, the mutex held scope. So we should put these things there. Um, and it should allow proper nesting whatever, but choose a counter or the bit thing, which is bad uh, performance-wise because you do, can't do it uh, next to the preemption counter in the same cache line, way, more, way cheaper. Um, talking about the immoral things. Um, so I named it preempt lazy disable, whatever. We can bike chat that to death. I hate it at the same time because it's not disabling. It's giving a hint, but uh, it didn't come up with a better name in the, in, in, in the few hours I had. So it, what it tells the scheduler, please avoid preemption here. If you must, you're good. Uh, if you don't must, if, if, you, if you must not, uh, please leave me alone. And this gives you proper nesting because uh, if something calls do stuff without that, the mutex lock inside might have the, the hint for the scheduler. But if you have something which is preparatory and has a, another contention point, you might want to, to annotate it, the whole section. So it properly nests and it only will go here and say, now it's, now it's cool. It's still everything can be preempted if you have a real-time task coming in or if you have, which solves, by the way, the, the voluntary problem because that's what the, 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 the audio people were lamenting about. Oh, we created a real-time audio thread and then it never gets, gets on the CPU because somebody is looping for, uh, for time slices and does a mem copy. Um, these kind of things we, we can fix with that. So, yes, I'm dreaming. Um, 
One preemption model with runtime switching solely at the scheduler level, I implemented a proof of concept for that where it can actually uh, set a, a scat feature bit and switch between none and um, fully preemptible. Uh, or T will be a separate, still a separate option, but as I explained, it's not a preemption model in the, in the sense that it's actually different from full. So you have this POC working, There's, I, I demonstrated that you can just run full, uh, n loops in the kernel pinned on the same CPU, and they do have no country scat and nothing in there, and they just get all of them uh, 100 uh, divided by n uh, percent CPU time automatically because the scheduler then says, "Hey, I ask you politely to do to preempt lazy, and you didn't." On the next tick, it says, "No, you go out," and I pick the next one, and it does the same game again, and so it, it levels out. We figured out that we have a few museums architectures in the way to do that because they do not even support preempt counters. Some people were very active on it, and some people just uh, said, oh, yeah, we find, we find a solution for that. So with that, we are at questions. So on the uh, on one slide, you said you're only checking on return for user space, but if you get rid of con resched, you have to also be checking when you return to the kernel from interrupt, right? Or am I did I miss a turn in there somewhere? Uh, so so if we go to scope hints like preempt lazy disable enable, then enable would check the lazy bit, obviously. Okay, so suppose we uh, didn't have the lazy hints, um, we, and we may need them. Okay, but I'm. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand the mechanism at this point. I'm not trying to say what would work or not. Uh, so it, we would have disable and enable. We're in the kernel. We loop for a long time. Eventually, it decides it wants to preempt. Yes, um, then it can, and, it can preempt you. Uh, immediately? or, or It uh, might be n not the ideal point. I, I said we might get rid of all the... Uh, it allows us to get rid. We okay, might so replace some of them with, with hints. Un un understood. Let me, let me try mm -hmm. to ask a different way at it. Um, so one way, and I don't know if this would work or not, one way of doing it would be to say, all right, we, set we, we said we want to we wanna preempt you, um, and if you've scheduled within some number of ticks, great, uh, you've taken care of it. Otherwise, then, then we would uh, preempt as long as you weren't in a no preempt critical section. Right. Is that, in that, is that kind of the, I understand you've got the other hint you want, so, so basically, the, the lazy preempt is if it goes scheduled, you're done mm -hmm. uh, because you voluntarily scheduled out. Right. If you reach the, the user space preemption point, right, like you of do course. now with, uh, with, with none, uh, you're preempted and it's mm -hmm. all good. The mm -hmm. only case is if you ignore right. lazy preempt and then it's a scheduler policy decision when it says no, no, long, no longer Mr. Mr. Okay. Nice Guy. And so the and so the that gets decided on return from interrupt at in for example from a scheduling clock interrupt. Right. So we so would that mean that if you have no first full, you would want to disallow none and voluntary to make that so you always have your interrupt to come back at that point? No, the the, the thing is, let me go back to that slide. Um, so the the preemption point is always there. All preemption points are always there. But they're only activated, and because we are smart about it right now, that we fold the, the, the need reset bit into the preemption counter itself. So we only get a zero transition of the preemption counter when need reset is set. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, as long as you do, do not have need reset, it's a pure decrement, and, and, and you're not taking Going, going somewhere. Of course, we have in the interrupt return path, we have to check for it. That preemption point will exist, has to exist for that purpose. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that goes back to no hertz full. If we're in a situation where we, no hertz full if you enter the kernel and spend a long time in the kernel, which is not what you're supposed to be doing in no hertz full, but it can happen. Um, in that case, the scheduling clock interrupt doesn't get turned on unless RCU is. Uh, sees the grace period going on for quite some time. So, in that, so would we want to disallow no hurts full and non-voluntary? 
As far as I know, nobody cares, but I figured I should ask. Uh, because you might not have an interrupt of any sort yeah, for an right. extended period of time. Right. I mean, that's something to be sorted. I didn't think okay. about that. Okay. Had to ask, you know. Yeah. And as I saw, uh, as I said, um, uh, at the beginning, I got wiser, older and wiser over time, and I got older and wiser in another aspect too. Ten years ago, I would have went off and wrote the 50 patches to actually make it work. Now I just wrote the proof of concept and let our younger people do it and I guide them. So um, if I understood correctly, you use, if you have to do a resched, the scheduler looks at slice is your, is your um, suggestion to determine if it has to ignore lazy and do the, the forced resched. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's how I implemented the proof of concept, whatever the policy is for that. Okay. So the, 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 the thing is, once you have the mechanism, then the mechanism itself doesn't enforce policy. Right. Yeah. So, so I think the like the idea behind having a lazy reschedule block is is a more sort of self evidently like intuitive way to signal, hey, I I, I don't want to be preempted if you can avoid it, as opposed to assuming it by default and then using con reschedule to opt out. So, like, I agree with the the idea behind the API, but for slice specifically, from what I understand, because EUVDF, um, one of the issues that people have run into is because context switches are so much higher. If you have a shorter slice to get the shorter deadline. I think Peter's proposal was to allow slice to be set inside the sket attribute. So I think if you did slice and that actually did happen, you could have a task that could set a really high slice for itself and then you wouldn't be you wouldn't be uh, preempted even if even if it had to happen and you could still have all the problems that, that Yeah, I mean that's to details to be sorted out. I just wanted to, to prove that the concept itself works and uh, from the conceptual yeah. level. Yeah, and for now it makes sense because you can't do that yet. So, <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Almost. Um, you were saying that it's um, a bad idea to schedule while holding a mutex. I think that also. It depends. Well, yeah, because it can lead to blocking on that mutex and. and it and depends. I mean, I mean. If you're preempted by a task which doesn't use the mutex, no, sure, it, it I, doesn't I, matter. I, I understand. It, it, it really depends on your, on, your, on your use case, on your application scenario. And I saw a lot of the throughput-oriented uh, um, uh, stuff really going into uh, lock ping-pong contention on mutexes, on reader writer semaphores and stuff like that. Sure, sure. And obviously, I've got the MMAP lock on my mind right now. Um, but what, what I was wondering is whether it makes sense to have perhaps an expert level debug knob that lets us know when we're scheduling while holding a mutex. Like, we, we've, we've done something that will block. Like, we've tried to allocate memory and it's going to block. You can do that with <laughs> tracing today. That's a good point. Thank you. <laughs> You just have to use it, it's there. <laughs> uh, um, I like the approach consisting in uh, removing uh, some parts which m look more like a decoration than anything else. I mean that uh, when I see a country sked, uh, for me it's a bit like a comment, in fact. You can, as you explained, you can move code around without changing these and uh, nobody notices and that's the problem and by enforcing certain things and make the developer have to think uh, what to protect i think it's much more efficient because it's easier to detect if it's properly done or not exactly like uh, with a lock right uh, when the locks are not properly done it's very quick to detect but uh, here, as yeah, you explained, the, the problem is that uh, you just feel like maybe it will be good this way and it can stay like this for 10 years without nobody noticing that it's not great. Yeah, and, and, and that's another charm of symmetric uh, um, yeah. uh, scope-based things because you actually can properly instrument it, you can proper, uh, mm. add proper debugging mechanism because it's always a, always a, a symmetric operation. And what I was wondering is, uh, do we have already uh, a way to count the number of uh, calls to country scared or preempt uh, disable or such things which are done within a single syscall? Tracing. 
Yeah, yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> but uh, and do we have estimates of uh, large numbers? Or maybe no, or I, I, don't, I don't have numbers on my mind yet. You know. okay. I mean, it's, I definitely have some uh, some statistic traces somewhere in my okay. ever-growing archive. I just have to find them again, but it's easy enough to reproduce them. <laughs> and it's really workload depending. It, ha it depends on. Which is colliery tech? Be, be, because I, I, I suspect that this could allow uh, your work could allow this number to significantly reduce. Uh, if you remove a lot of these coal places uh, where this uh, uh, this preemption uh, is enabled, disabled, enabled, disabled all the time. With this, there are change, chances that this uh, significantly reduces. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so. so so as you have a lot of implicit uh, preempt disabled, like uh, every spin lock, every reader write lock disables pre preemption. So there's a lot of those. But again, it depends on the copath taken. Yeah. We have copaths which take a single spin lock. So it's, well, OK, good. And then go back to user space. Or we have copaths which take gazillions of them. So go into file systems. Or horrible. Um, or memory management or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of it. And now people try to remove the locks, and everything is RCU nowadays, so we are all good. We'll never see that again uh, soon. What would be the, the decision to preempt a lazy task? Like, when do you do that? You have a higher pre task, or? So again, that's a policy problem we have to sort out. So. Right now, I implemented it in the way that I, 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 I forcefully preempt when I have a, a real-time task yeah. uh, being awoken. So while I ran the, the three hawks, I ran cyclic test uh, with uh, prior, uh, pri uh, FIFO, uh, a priority 80 on it, and it, and it just got in between all the time. So, but yeah. that's a policy decision. That's nothing. Uh, yeah. We really have to. That's a, that's a fundamental mistake people make, make all the time, is they, conf they convolute policy and mechanisms. So in general, that's what we always try to do in the kernel. We provide a mechanism and policy comes from somewhere else. Because if you, for your particular use case, create the policy, then it's with a very high probability wrong for all other use cases. So we really have to have that uh, under the control of the entity which actually cares about resources. Yeah, so one thing I was also thinking about was that, um, you know, the whole condition reschedule is to help prevent watchdog lockups and everything like that um, that we have in there. So yeah, you have to click your, exit your presentation. So the, um, People have to be aware of this because if they have this thing, I was thinking they might have to double the time frame because, you know, if we now have this lazy preemptions and we get rid of all the condition rescheds and say the watchdog lockup is 20 seconds and we have something that actually spins for well, 25 seconds. 21. Yeah, so 25 seconds and you have something that spins for like maybe 20 seconds uh, without that. So I guess what do you have to do? You have to like preempt, make sure the preemption happens within the 20 seconds. But let's say we have a preempt to for like 20 seconds, a real hard preempt disable. Yeah, I mean. And then, so that extends out. So say if you're like, okay, maybe we should have to throw in like our kind of our condition reset. I mean, if you have a preempt disable for 20 seconds, something is really wrong. Yes, but. And then, that, then the lazy with, problem is the least of your yeah. worries. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's why we have the lockup detectors and all these kinds of things happening. You mentioned RCU, so I'm afraid I have to ask. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. So if uh, we're in a situation where the wake up was in your current patch, a sked other task, okay, so it says the lazy resked bit, not the full resked bit, correct? And then, uh, so I'm coming out right now in none, there'll be a preempt enable, uh, which would actually generate code with this change, as I understand. No, it, it would not preempt. If, uh, if only the, the lazy so it, bit is set, it wouldn't preempt there. Ex okay, thank you, that was what I was asking. And so, so only if there was a real time task, then it would because that would set you the, actually put it down to that zero. would set the 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 the, the, the need reset flag. So so the the thing I made I how I implemented it uh, for for this 
proof of concept no, no, is. No, 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 no. is set on uh, for Scatter. <laughs> and for the time slice exhaustion, I enforce need rescat and if uh, a real time priority task gets uh, woken up and can obviously preempt, then it sets need rescat because it says I want to on the CPU now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then preempt, that's the important thing that we have to preempt counter because uh, this allows us to actually do immediate rescheduling because we know we are out of the spin lock held critical section or whatever is protected by preempt, by preempt disabled, which we don't know if we don't have the preempt counter enabled. No, having, and then, having and the then we only check need resket in the preempt counter to zero transition and the lazy bit is just ignored at that point. Okay. So it's not introducing overhead either, uh, because we can. Uh, I was uh, shortly, briefly debating with myself to fold all of this into the preempt count, but I gave up on it very fast because it makes preempt count actually slow. Yeah. Uh, so and there's no value because we just check it in in a return to user space, and so the, there it's uh, whether we do an end of one bit on a, on a register or an end of two bits on a register and check for the result is exactly the same costs. So there, there's no overhead there. Yeah. Um, so, the, so um, I mean, sure, I could get annoyed because uh, RC Readlock is no longer uh, a no-op totally, but on the other hand, having the preempt count is something that, as you say, we push for many times and would have yeah. some benefits. For one thing, I could tell whether I, whether somebody held a spin lock when they call call RCU and and <laughs> take it into account, which would be helpful. I think uh, I mean even even Linus agreed that uh, having it around permanently will prevent yeah. some clauses of issues which we had in the but, post. Uh, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot of testing that needs to be done because we don't know what the heck this thing's going to do. <coughs> yeah, I mean it's not. Uh, as I said, coming soon, yes, uh, maybe. Um, there's a lot of work ahead, but uh, I think it's worthwhile to um, explore uh, explore that path um, because it gets rid of so many un and ill-defined things which we have around the preemption models um, that it's worthwhile to go there. Any other questions? Uh, is there any reason for um, the, the syscalls to be checked only on return? Because in my opinion, certain syscalls would probably benefit from being checked uh, during the input to the uh, entry to the syscall. I mean that certain syscalls like Paul, for example, would better be preempted uh, before being called so that they can collect. Yeah, I mean, that's something you need, you can do today. It's just adding the code and, and, and do some experiments, whether it's beneficial or not. I don't know. But my, my, uh, my idea behind this would be that maybe we could uh, ultimately categorize some syscalls to say, okay, these ones would prefer to be prompted before and others after. I don't maybe. Know. I don't know. So it's easy, it would be easy enough to, uh, to experiment with that today, even, even independent of these changes. Okay. Yeah, it's for sure. It's just in the, in the, in the entry function to add, add some, some of the work flag bits and add this to the work. Uh, checks uh, should be should be trivial to do okay so i'm standing in the way between you and lunch <laughs> so uh, i hate to stand in the way uh, and thank you